Hey. Hello, is this Maceo? This is Maceo speaking. Hello, sir. This is Dustin Wilmes from KMSU Radio. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Excellent. It's an honor to be speaking with you. Uh, again, thank you. <laughs> well, I'll introduce you to my co-host, Tun. Okay. Hey, Maceo. How are you doing? I'm trying to hang, man. You know, there's nothing passing but the years, and <laughs> and you, you try to find ways to smile, you know, <laughs> through it all, and, and that makes uh, the years passing, uh, you know, uh, pleasurable. Oh, come way. on. Come on. Now, all the things you've done, Maceo, you got to be smiling 24-7. Yeah, <laughs> but but what you know what you know seriously what sticks in my mind is when I was back in high school I played high school football and I was the fastest on the football team and I could run about the same speed when I was forty. <laughs> now that I'm almost not quite twice forty, but I can't run like you know what I'm saying. Oh man! And that's that's <laughs> the kind of like okay, well I had a good you know a good uh, beginning <laughs> and all that. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I guess even talking about uh, old days and playing football, can you talk to yeah. us about how you started playing playing the sax, playing music? Well, I was lucky in that I had a brother a year older than me that played trombone. And then I came with the saxophone, and then I had a brother behind me, a year behind me to play drums. Now, we, we were something like, what, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, ten, 8, 9, 10, you know, whatever the ages are. But we're always together, keeping noise and like that. But I think one of the main things about like a serious kind of music thing is that my my uncle had a band, and you know, like a a, a, a band that played tunes like whatever the popular tunes are and blueses and little jazzy stuff and all that. So and and my mom and and our father, uh, you know, did the church stuff, the choirs and the. Uh, Dixie Hummingbird stuff and Mayo's Choir and all that. So music was part of life uh, since day one. And we had a lot to sort of pick and choose from because we had, you know, the the church stuff on one side and on the other side we had my uncle's stuff. And then we got to a point where uh, we wanted to hear everything and, you know, sort of try to play everything. So it all got started very, 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 very young. And Somehow, uh, not only me, we just felt that music was going to be a part of our lives, but especially me, put it that way. Well, we got to ask you, uh, joining up with James Brown, how did that come about? I know you and your brother both played with him. Yeah, um, as I said, as I said, uh, you know, we, we started a group and we had a group all through high school. So then as, as uh, you know, we graduated from high school, that means there's one less. You know, it's going off, and then the second one goes, which is me. I happen to go from Kinston, North Carolina, to Greensboro, North Carolina, to A and T, and as a music student, and I got into like a little gig band because it's always, you know, nice, very, very good to have a uh, little, little, you know, something to do and make a little twenty-five, thirty dollars, whatever the, whatever the thing is, and boom. Now my second year, my brother behind me, the drummer Melvin happens to come to, you know, the school where I am. Only thing is we can't play in the same group while we're in school because, you know, I'm already established in a in a in a group for when we're away, you know, in, in school. So he's in a in a in a, in another group. Anyway, just trying to make a long story short, uh James I'm playing out of state somewhere. My brother Melvin is playing with the group that he's in, uh uh, out of what no no uh, uh, after our after our joint and and James Brown is playing at some little place but James finishes first and he's not ready to leave Greensboro North Carolina and he says well, where can I go where well, is this place of mine and he happens to go to the place where my brother is playing he liked that group but he especially liked my brother uh, the drummer to a point where he said I want to meet him and again just kind of get kind of chase through it you know I'm I'm James Brown like. You know, I know you're a student. I'm not saying be a student, but I am saying that there's a time you're not a student and you want to have a, a job with me, handshake, boom, that's it. So when I come back in town, first thing I do, got to do check on the brother, and then I get the whole, you know, full James Brown story, boom. Then, I said, okay, well, that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, but one thing you have to keep in mind, that, you know, once we started, like, really, really, really young, we never stopped We're trying to, you know, come up, up with our own styles and our own, you know, you know, dot up uh, drumming this way plays it that way and this saxophone player plays this way but it wouldn't be nice if we 
you know, we you just have our own style. So we started trying to get our own style, like really, really young. And so it was no surprise to me when my brother told me, you know, he, he met James Brown, James Brown liked him because I, I knew, you know, what he was doing as a drummer. Anyway, uh, another year passed, and we did, now we're not going to class that, that well. I'm a junior now, and I know the ropes, and we're having fun and like that. So I, I just said, you know what, let's, let's get out of school until we get the old studios, you know, open the book thing again and, uh, you know, stop wasting time and like that. And then he said, well, okay, we're fine. Well, what are we going to do? I said, well, let's try to get a job, job with James Brown. You remember the James Brown stories? Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. And then, so what we did was kind of hung around uh, Greensboro until we found out he was coming. And the way we found him was, I said, okay, he's going to play the Coliseum. So we got in the car and just drove around the perimeter of the Coliseum. As soon as we see a, uh, this is what we thought, as soon as we see a, a limousine, got to be James Brown or a bus or whatever. And you sure know, limousine came, limousine came, we right, we right behind him and stuff. And, uh, Hey, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, I'm Melvin Parker. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm not a student anymore. I'd like to have that job. Like you told, oh, yeah, right. He's very James Brown, really excited. And I'm kind of excited, too, because, you know, this is D. James Brown, you know, being excited about my brother. Yeah, right, okay. It called everybody over. But, and then somewhere in the, in the course of, um, you know, being all excited about my brother, you know, being there, he said, oh, uh, Mr. Brown, excuse me, this, this is my brother. He's a saxophone player. He needs a job, too. So James <laughs> First thing he ever, ever said to me in life was, do you play baritone sax? And at that time, the tenor saxophone was my major. But something told me if I tell him no, in a, in a, uh, in a story, in a question, turns around and all the focus is back on my brother. So I had to answer him like this. Do you play baritone sax? I go, uh, yes, sir, like that. Then he says, do you own a baritone sax? Again, I go, yes, sir. I tell you what, <laughs> you can get a baritone sax. You can have a job to put his hand out, shook my hand. Once he shook my hand, I knew that's the seal. That's, that was uh, you know, the beginning of all this Macy O'Blue Blow Your Horn stuff. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's pretty wild first meeting. Now, we know over kind of more recent years, a lot more music has been released where uh, you get to hear you guys sort of it sounds like it's just you're jamming, like you're playing these tunes, but it's these big extended versions. Talk yeah. to us about the recording process. And I mean, you know, James would call out to you. And yeah. Was it just free form or how structured was that? It, it wasn't really structured, not really. But then again, in, 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 um, if you look at it, it was a little bit, but he knew that, that jam, he liked that jamming kind of a feeling. A lot of times he didn't know, you know, where he was going, but he knew he had an A and a B, but he didn't know what, and he wanted to have a C and a D, if you can understand what I'm saying, as far as, you know, what's going to go. And he sometimes he gets fueled by what's going on, what he's feeling once we get from A to B. And, you know, which means, God, boy, you know, it'd be nice to have a, you know, while he's, while he's doing the oops and ahs and whatever he's doing and clapping your hands and all this stuff. It, it may be nice to have a sex solo here or a drum solo or whatever. You know, he just get fueled by uh, the excitement of what he's doing. And um, so I got to tell you, let me kind of interject a little bit on how I, you know, I, I got to play the, the tenor because um, I, I, I had to go down and get a baritone because I'm hired as a baritone player. So I don't want to show up with a tenor. Like I say, I'm not really proud to be here with a baritone, but, uh, so I'm playing baritone when I first get it, you know, on the stage with, with James Brown, I'm playing baritone. And he had three tenor players, but only one did most of the solos. Um, but then this, this uh, uh, young man got sick. It had to be away. And I remember James being worried. Oh, my goodness, I got to get somebody to do the solo. Apparently, he didn't particularly like the other two guys, do, you know, solo work. And that's when I stepped up and said, you know what, Mr. Brown, this, that's, Sort of what I do. I can I can handle that. You can. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we'll we'll try you out tonight and, and see what happens. And then once <laughs> once he heard me play, he said, "You know what? Call me in, uh, dressing room or something." And, and uh and said, "You know what? When when the other guy comes back, I don't know how long he's going to be gone. Another week, week and a half or whatever. But when he comes back, you tell him I said on this tune and blah tune and the blah tune and the blah tune and this one and blah blah blah." You're going to play solo on this one, and he can play solo on the rest. And now you're both going to have double duty. While I'm doing tennis, like he, 
and you know can, can play baritone and while he's playing tenor i can play baritone so we're switching around like that and uh we we got to papa's got a brand new bag and we had recorded or talked about everything except who's going to solo and while we were he was recording back then he didn't like to, he once he started recording he never wanted to stop you know, they said you might, might miss something, so he'd go on and go on, just on and on and on. Then he realized that, uh oh, I didn't say which one I wanted to do. You know, the sax solo, and we knew it was going to be uh, a uh, a uh, tenor tenor sax solo. Uh, then he kept, ooh, and it did it dawn on him during the recording, which he did not want to stop. That, uh oh, I didn't tell which one I wanted to do. The other guy named was named uh, Saint Clair. Saint Clair, that's named Pink Pinkney, and he then he goes, ooh, come on, ooh, I blow, 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 oh, ooh, something, something. I want you to blow Maceo, and that started that. <laughs> and although I did a baritone sax solo in that, in that tune too, it was it was kind of crazy. But it was it was the beginning of uh, it was be- the beginning of of uh, what you call the, the the snowball rolling down the hill, I guess. Uh, because you know that as as the, as the uh, the music goes all around the world, which, you know, sometimes I learned once I started traveling around the world, you know, you have all these reunions and you have uh, families uh, at these family reunions and you always got somebody want to imitate James Brown and while they're imitating James Brown, sort of like uh, Eddie Murphy, you got, uh, you know, a cousin or, or, or a uh, brother or uncle or somebody roll up a newspaper, they're going to be Maceo. And it's, I mean, all around the world that happens. And it's crazy, but it's cool. <laughs> for sure super cool yeah yeah you guys uh, definitely recorded some of the most important music out there and uh, i know that um as you mentioned you know he kind of had a lot of different players over the years and i know you uh, yeah. you kind of were there and then left and came back a couple times i mean was he difficult to work with i know a lot of people say that if you don't have your stuff down uh, he could be a bit difficult did you find it to be that no, it was very interesting to me. It, to me, it was sort of like going to school. You know, like, I mean, just learning how he did, what made him pick, what made him, dis, you know, make his decisions on, you know, what to do and how to do it, you know, on the stage. He was, he was, you know, Mr. Dynamite, the amazing Mr. Police, all those little accolades and all this stuff. And I used to just wonder why, you know, why is that? And, you know, but he could really, really move his feet too. I mean, really dance, you know, and, and, and that style that he was doing was his, he is, you know, nobody else was dancing like that. Uh, I don't think. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and it, it, it was amazing, you know, and, 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 um, sometimes I said, okay, first of all, we're going to the university of James Brown and, you know, we have the best seat in the house cause we're only like a foot, foot and a half from him. And so I used to ask myself, why does he, why does he um, maybe uh, uh, repeat a tune? And, and uh, you know, how many fast songs you go, you do before you know? And I just studied this stuff and studied it and studied it. And, you know, it was just his way of working the crowd, getting the crowd into it, you know, taking them up, you know, bring them back down a little bit, and, it, you know, take them back up again and all of this. And it was great. And I just learned so much from, you know, just from being, I was really, really uh, uh, lucky you know, to be in that position, you know, just to be that close to him and learn as much as I did uh, from him. And it, it was it was, it was was great. Well, we know you uh, played a lot with uh, Parliament Funkadelic and, and George Clinton. Was that dynamic um, similar to working with James, or, or was it kind of the opposite, maybe more relaxed and not quite as structured? Uh, very, uh, very similar. Very similar as far as working that crowd to a frenzy, you know, because uh, James would, would, would do that, you know, to fall on the on the on the floor, you know, with the, with the cape, you, you know, at, at the end of Please Please and stomping and all the footwork and, and the strobe lights and, you know, he's doing all these dances and stuff. But when, when George decided to, uh, which his concept was, first of all, he's from out of space and <laughs> and we were at that period where we were landing the, the uh, spaceship on the, on the stage, people would go crazy. I mean, absolutely crazy because they had it, uh, um, they had it set where it looked as if he really was coming out out of a spaceship, <laughs> and people would, would would go crazy. Now, the only uh, what I say night and day from James Brown, you know, not not the not the music, but the concept of you know what you wear, because 
you know, with, with James Brown, it's like, okay, we got, you know, we got this color uh, um, tuxedo and this color and then matching uh, um, um, little tie, bow ties and, you know, nice shirts and, and tuxedo shirts and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, all this stuff and, and you know, sh- shoe shine and, and this kind of concept. It, now, now <laughs> Joe's concept was the complete opposite. A guy would go to Joe and say, you know what, man, I've been into locomotive locomotives all my life and would it be you think it'd be okay if i if i just uh, wore a, like a like a, a train engineer a uniform kind of thing <laughs> oh yeah yeah right right no that's fine that's, that's cool and other guy said man you know what i'm into native america and you know i i, I kind of like uh you know if, if i could wear the you know the thing and the, and, the, and, the, and the feathers feathers and all this and blah, would that be okay yes yes and i'm going what <laughs> no no what and the guy said and then another guy would come up and say you know what uh, George, you know what? I don't like shoes at all. You know, I I just don't. You know, my <laughs> grandfather used to walk around. I used to wonder why he would walk around with no shoes. And I kind of got into that. So you think it would be okay if I didn't have it? Yes, man, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and I'm going, I, what? I don't believe this. But that was his concept, you know. Uh, life ain't nothing but a party. You don't have time to just, be, you know, worry about, you know, color coordinations and all that stuff. And, uh he would do, we were doing Atomic Dog, and he they had a partner. We said, "I gotta find me a dog. I gotta find me a dog." And he'd walk around the stage, look, and he point, and and send out the way he point and all the risky guys. That's when I was doing. Uh, I was MC then. I just walk around and keep the time, and and uh, you know let him know how much more time we got, and start a tune, and cut it off, and stuff like that. Uh, but he'd go down, he'd grab somebody, and and uh, and uh, throw him on the stage. Always a woman, and you know, kind of hefty woman, and they put him on the stage, and they all. Uh, you know, get around and and, and uh, um, rotating your face and all kinds. Of, I mean, all kinds of crazy people be going crazy, but that's that was George, <laughs> and 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 it was cool. But and and the difference is like night and day. But as the 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 funk and the groove and all that, just about the same. It's interesting your career. I mean, when you were with James Brown in the early days, you guys really kind of creating the uh, the funk genre and kind of the R and B and. Then later on, all the uh, hip hop guys sampled all the stuff that you did back then, and and then created a, a second genre. I mean, did you guys ever think that you know this music would be still kind of being recycled and used over and over all these years afterwards? No, no. But I knew just being, although I I, I didn't really act on it like I, as, as as I should, but uh, I knew that working with James and and and, uh, and having my name out there. Uh, it was almost like uh, you know he's 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 approving me or sanctioning me or something like that. You know, come on, make sure, make sure, blow your horn, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure. So then, you know, it sort of make people wonder. Okay, who is Maceo? First of all, and he must be kind of okay because James Brown calls his name all the time, but not, not only me. I mean, there's also Fred Wesley, uh, Pee Wee Ellis did uh, Cold Sweat. You know, but but most of the time it's, it's it's me doing the the you know the come on, make sure, blow your horn kind of thing, and. It, it, it was, again, it was great. I mean, really, 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 really great to poke where, you know, when they did the movie, they weren't accurate with a lot of stuff, or nor did they, you know, <laughs> seek me out, you know, to ask my <laughs> my opinion on stuff. But but my character was there, and you know, which which, which was cool. Are you are you talking about that newer the the later James yeah. Brown film that came out? Yeah, we thought right. it was interesting as well. We had Fred Wesley on our show, and I don't think yeah. they even mentioned his name. And we were both like, "What's going on yeah. here?" So, pretty interesting. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird. It, it 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 it's you know, I, and, and you can't you know, being from on this end of it, you can't really know how that was and why it was. You know, it, it, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but you know, as for instance, I was talking with uh, Jack Bart who's the son of Ben Bart, who, you know, first started producing James. Um, and we were talking after the movie, and he said, make sure you remember the part about, uh, he said, when, when my dad died and they had James covering, you know, covering the grave site, you know, he, he took the shovel, shovel and put, put the dirty day over the thing. I said, yeah, yeah, I remember that. He said, and actually I also said, said, James didn't even come to the funeral. He didn't even go to the funeral. He wasn't even there. <laughs> you know the way it actually went so you know but it, but you have to chalk it up to some kind of hollywood something where they have they get rights to do and do how and change and stuff you know and do it however they want to so uh, they, again you know that's just the way it came out 
but I thought I thought the the, the guy the guy that did forty two, Postman or something like that. I thought he did a great 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 job of uh, of uh, you know portraying James Brown. I really did. Well, we got to ask you about your time working with Prince. I mean, you, you basically shared the stage with uh, with all these geniuses in the world of music. Yeah. I mean, do you kind of put him up there in that same that same stratosphere? I guess as a, a James Brown or a George Clinton was he kind of uh, on that same level? Yeah, 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 yeah. He he. Uh, to me, he may be a, a little above the uh, a, a little bit. Uh, but certainly, you know, right, right, right around there. Now, having said that, I also have said to him, uh, because of his wishes, he really don't like being part of the interview. But I, I said that much, and that's pretty much, you know, I, I love the guy. He's a sweetheart, and that's pretty much all I can say about him. So do you think maybe you'll work with him uh, down the road again? or we, Hopefully. Hopefully. Meaning, you know, if he can stand, you know, for, you know, at this this productive age I am now, and 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 what I put out, because I, I, uh, I, I, I still can get it from time to time. <laughs> it's still <laughs> there, uh, and you know, it's it's, it's, it's uh, you know, as as um as as the sun rises and sets and rises and sets and rises and sets, it affects us all, and so you know. So none of us are, you know, we're not 18 anymore, but we still do what we do, and we are who we are, and that will always be. I used to say uh, a, a while back, golly, but I mean, B.B. King, are you kidding me? Wow, he comes in there, sit down, and he takes that guitar, and he gets B.B. King, but now that, he, you know, now that he's gone, you know, I can't, can't use him anymore, but it's still the same kind of concept. You know, if you're still around, you know, you're still going to be who you are, and you bring what you bring, and people are going to smile and say, yeah, man, that's, wow, that's, oh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, I remember. And that's what it's all about. As long as you, you can make, as long as you make people smile and feel good about the present, then, you know, you're doing what, what, what's worthwhile. And ever since day one, I really felt that I was born to do what I, you know, ended up doing, going around the world and you know, performing and and and, uh, and and making people feel good about themselves and, and about music and, and about entertainment. Well, I think that's uh, just what you've done. I know somewhat recently you you released a book, ninety eight percent funky stuff. Is that can talk right. to us about that? Does that talk about your life and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was a uh, a um, um, an idea from my manager. Said, "Why don't you do you know blah." And so we got together and, uh, you know, I said some stuff and somebody was writing some stuff down and blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, it's in a book form. And uh, I, I, you know, thumbed through it from time to time because, like I say, it's, kind of, it's sort of easy to, you know, reflect back on your, on your youth. Uh, and, and some of the things I smile about, some things I, I'm not, you know, I don't smile too much about. <laughs> uh, but it it it, uh, it happens, you know, like your your like say your high school stuff. It happens like it happens, like how how it goes, it goes. And uh, I was lucky uh, again uh, in my high school uh, period, where I had a, a, a saxophone player to come in in my eighth grade year. So I had a professional saxophone player as a high, as a uh, band director for five years, and I noticed a lot of students. Uh, seem like their game, their their ambition, or you know what they wanted to, to, to do, or what gauge they did, and how many notes you could play in you know so many seconds or something like that, the faster you can play something like that, which was not mine. Mine was because I noticed all students sounded like students, and he sounded like a professional. My thing was I want to sound if I, I if I only do one note, I wanted to sound like this guy. So that became mine. So I had like five years to, to do that and then at the end of those, those five years i can give you a blindfold test you couldn't tell which was playing me or, or him the truth mm-hmm. and uh so so uh, again i you know when i reflect back on, on on my whole career or life or you know music thing you know the the almost three years that i did in college thinking uh they can groove me into becoming a music educator um, then, uh, no, I don't, I don't, think, you know, I, I would just rather be a performer, I'd be, be a performer and, and be able to travel around the world 
And now that I've done that, you know, and oh, that's what I do. You know, I'm re- really, really satisfied in, uh, again, in, in that, you know, how the whole thing came out. Well, yeah, and obviously you are still, um, you're still out there doing it, you know, making people smile and uh, touring the world. And I know you're on tour right now. Can can you maybe describe to the listeners uh, what a Maceo Parker show might be like if they've never seen you before? Well, I, I, I uh, somewhere I was lucky enough to do a, well, let me tell you this. Uh, in my second year, I think, at ENT, I had already seen Ray Charles in my hometown about, what three times maybe, but he came to Green uh, came came to Greensboro too, at the Coliseum, uh, same place I met James, and somehow I made my way back, back you know in the in the in the dressing room area somehow I don't know how I did it but I did, and I was in awe of Ray Charles I really was kind of like, you know looking like looking at somebody with a halo <laughs> over their heads or something mm-hmm. that's that's how I felt about Ray Charles, but anyway I I I, I raised my my right hand and my, my my finger, and I said, "You know what, Mr. Ray Charles? I'm not talking to him. I'm I'm just talking because he's way 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 you can't hear him, but I'm talking." And I said, "You know what, Mr. Ray Charles? One of these days, you are going to know me. I'm a sophomore in college, but I said you're going to know me. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but you are going to know me. I just had that. Uh, how can I describe it? I just had a uh, something inside me that told me." I had what it took or something, some kind of magnetic something that one day I'm going to meet Ray Charles and, you know, probably be on the stage with him and all of that. I, I just had that feeling back then. That was in 60 U-Bolds, 1962. And I think it was uh, something like 92, 93 or something, three or four, something like that. I opened for him over in Europe, uh, Maceo Parker and Ray Charles, and big banner that hung across each stage, uh, they take it up, put it down, take it up, put it down. It says Maceo Parker and Ray Charles. And um, on one of the afternoons, he allowed me to come in and do psych solo on one of the tunes and like that. And I always reflect back on when I was a sophomore in college saying, I don't know how I'm going to do it, Mr. Ray Charles, but one of these days you're going to know me and all that, 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 you know, it, it came true. And I, Oh yeah, by the way, I have that banner right here in my home somewhere. <laughs> still rolled up. Uh, but, but sometimes you have to, you have to uh, be careful for what you wish for because, you know, it, you just might come true, you know, <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I, I thought about Ray Charles and I thought about, you know, how that thing, but, but I, I, I recorded uh, some Ray Charles stuff with a big band out of Cologne, Germany. I mean, great, uh, big, big, um, big, big, uh, what do you call it, jazz band, and, and uh, you know, which turned out to be, you know, sort of, sort of nice for me. So in my show, I do, you know, some Ray Charles stuff. Obviously, obviously I got to do James Brown stuff, and I do some some Nature some Parker stuff, and then I might throw some George Clinton in there, too. So, you know, a mixture of all of that, you know, and then, you know, perhaps give the drummer some, you know, something like that. That's it. That, that, that's it. Maybe throw a ballad or something in there, and uh, and and I always carry. And I've been doing this for a while. Carry love as a theme because I, I yeah, it came to me uh, once. You know what? The microphone is, is is on and it's and it's in front of me all the time, or most of the time. So I can get a message out there, and the message is something about love. So I came up with. You know what? Our theme will be we love you. Always remember. We love you, and then sometimes say you know something like when I'm when I'm anywhere in the world, you know, all you have to do to solve these problems is lift love up somehow, you know, a little higher or something like that. And then say, oh, okay, what is love? And nothing but courtesy, extending courtesy. You know, uh, unfortunately, we have to for whatever reason, you know, we have these little things to break out here and there and all that. There's no way to get around that. I don't think if somebody set on just you know being destructive and doing you know little crazy, crazy stuff. But at the same time, they're gonna know that we love them, you know. And hopefully, you know that'll uh, 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 lessen their whatever they feel like. You know, gotta keep them doing whatever it is they're doing. You know, the 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 the, the destructive stuff. Somebody gotta hear. You know, something about love somebody and hopefully you know they can can hear that sometime and, and uh 
you know, change their whole outlook on, on uh, why they feel like they have to, to uh, you know, to hurt people and stuff. I really have to say, Maceo, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. It's beautiful. I hope uh, I hope your show goes well. You're going to be playing on the 15th of April in Antones in right. Austin, Texas. Everybody needs to check oh, yeah. it out. Yeah, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Maceo. It's been an honor. Right. Looking forward to being there. Thank you again. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.